Hello, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Ethan Kent, I'm Executive Director of Placemaking X. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us for this important conversation about preserving our public spaces and our connections to them during this challenging time. Um, I hope that you and all your loved ones are, are well and safe. Uh, our thoughts are certainly with those who are suffering right now and at risk. Uh, we know that many do not have access to all types of essential services. Um, this webinar is really about how do we make the case for public spaces as essential services, um, but make sure they're provided in a safe way, um, in a way that's also uh, accessible in an equitable way. Um, I wanna wish everyone a happy Earth Week. Uh, this crisis has also been about us reconnecting with our planet, uh, thinking more consciously about our public spaces of all kinds, um, we, in a way where, because we're not connected to them, we perhaps appreciate them more, but also when we have had chances to go out into them, I think many are, are finding a new appreciation and love for our public spaces. Um, but we're rethinking our relationship to them in general. Uh, and, and we're also proving through this crisis that we can live perhaps more locally and more harmoniously with our environment. Uh, 50 years ago this week, uh, my father, Fred Kent, actually organized the first Earth Day in New York City, closing Fifth Avenue uh, and demonstrating a different way to, to use uh, street space at that time. Um, and in many ways, this is being demonstrated both informally and formally around the world, uh, how streets can be used as better public spaces. So placemaking, though, builds on the environmentalism that has been you know, shaped and spawned by Earth Day and Earth Weeks around the world. Um, but it brings in new partners, new energy, new causes together. Placemaking is about partnering and putting into motion a virtuous cycle of contributions to our shared spaces uh, and to our connections to each other. Uh, and you know, it is these local support networks, our connections to each other, uh, that often exist because of our connections to public space and public life. It is these connections that will pull us out of this crisis and are enabling us to, to, to sustain our, our, our lives in many ways currently. Uh, and indeed, in many different types of crises, there are studies that show that 95% of aid is, is rendered through existing social connections and social capital. Um, in this crisis, we cannot forget, though, that many of the, of the, the gravest public health challenges are caused uh, in a large part by social disconnection and a lack of access to safe public spaces. Uh, you know, crises like addiction, depression, chronic diseases, and even road deaths. We founded Placemaking X a year ago to develop and amplify collective advocacy and collective action for public spaces. Uh, we're applying the principles of placemaking to the placemaking community, uh, drawing out collective expertise to heal and reinvigorate our societies. Uh, in the first year of Placemaking X, we supported and helped, helped, helped uh, create uh, 14 regional placemaking networks uh, and recently in, or had them all online um, sharing what they're doing during this crisis. Um, and this, the focus this year is to start focusing on cross-cutting issues with drawing from expertise around the world. So this is actually the first public webinar we've done uh, and are looking to, to build on this conversation and others like this, drawing on public space experts globally. So with this webinar, we have an extraordinary um, collective expertise that I'm so happy to be able to bring together. Um, and we have, and, and all going to be moderated by Giselle Seabag. Um, but first we have Mark Nguyen, who's in, uh, who's uh, from IC Global in Barcelona, the Institute, uh, the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. Uh, he's the director of Urban Planning, Environment and Health Initiative and a director of Air Pollution and Urban Environment Program there and brings an epidemiological perspective to this conversation. I'm also really excited to have Mitch Silver here, the Parks Commissioner for New York City uh, and the past president of the American Planning Association. He's been a longtime collaborator and partner of ours in the public space community globally, uh, generously sharing his insights and in, uh, in advocacy through, through many mediums and, and, and through social media. Um, and he's been a, as a public space champion for many years. He's now reimagining New York City's parks as parks without borders and has tires, tirelessly been championing parks um, through this crisis, helping them stay open and helping people you know, ensure they're used safely. Uh, also glad to have Gil Peniosa here, a, a friend for over 20 years, since he was Parks Commissioner in Bogota, uh, and, and since he started 880 Cities and has been Chair of the World Urban Parks. Um, we've gotten to work with him in many contexts around the world and, and continually realized he's the most enthusiastic 
an insightful, inspiring speaker on public spaces and a strong advocate for their use, especially during these challenging times. Uh, we're also joined by Sarah Ruel Bergeron, uh, who's the Director of Projects and Development at Archive Global. And she, she really works at the intersection of design and public health in some of the world's most vulnerable communities. Archive Global stands for Architecture for Health and Vulnerable Environments, harnesses the power of the built environment to improve health outcomes in vulnerable communities around the world. I'm also very excited that we're included, we're joined by two uh, colleagues, close colleagues at UN Habitat, um, who's been a partner of ours for many years and uh, in supporting their public space program. Laura Petrella, who helped start the program, um, is the Chief of Planning, Finance, and Economy uh, at the Economy Section of the Urban Practices Branches of UN Habitat, um, and has been a collaborator for many years. And Mark Ojal, who's with the Public Space Program at UN Habitat, uh, was also helped start Placemaking Nairobi before joining UN Habitat uh, and building the Placemaking Campaign in Nairobi and now in many other cities around Africa. Uh, uh, and lastly, we have Kelly Varel, uh, who's been a colleague of mine um, at Project for Public Spaces the last uh, more than a decade, uh, and uh, is now Senior Director of Programs and Projects there. Um, Kelly has worked to make public markets and local food systems viable and impactful in many challenging settings around the U.S. and globally, and we're excited to have her uh, bring that perspective of, of the important role that public spaces and markets play in supporting local food access um, and public space environments. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Giselle Seabag, who is a master's in public health, is with Bloomberg Associates now. Um, we actually first got to know her when she was at the Clinton Foundation, leading the built environment track there. I don't think anyone understands a broader perspective of the connection between built environment and public health than, than she does, and, and the many exciting players uh, in the field in that conversation. She is a master's from Harvard in public health and is still involved in the public health school there. Um, she worked with Project for Public Spaces for a short time and now is working with, uh, with Bloomberg um, uh, with, with Amanda Burden, who also started her career at Project for Public Spaces as I did. Um, so <laughs> with that, I'm very excited to turn it over to Giselle, who will lead the conversation and, and, and moderate the, the questions. So thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Uh, and just a reminder that this, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat. You can also help share the webinar and future webinars um, through social media. Um, we're, we're looking at a, a hashtag as a safe places during COVID. Uh, if you want to, if you feel like sharing on social media during this or after the, this event. So thank you so much for joining. Giselle, please. Thanks so much, Ethan. And thank you so much to Placemaking X for hosting this important conversation. Um, I firstly want to say that it's just an absolute pleasure to be here with this incredibly remarkable panel that we have. So thanks to all of our panelists for taking their time today. Um, and also to all, I know we had more than 850 people who registered for this webinar today uh, from a really diverse range of countries. We had more than 50 countries represented at the last count. So um, I think it's especially encouraging to see so many people who share our concern that maintaining access to public spaces, which really are one of our most vital health infrastructure components during this crisis, as absolutely crucial um, as we do. So, you know, despite the strong body of evidence that's shown us over and over that spending time in nature is one of the most effective medicines we have for decreasing stress, anxiety, mood disorders, and can have important positive effects on things like cognitive development, attention capacity, and learning, and then the countless studies that have shown us over and over that physical activity is really one of our best ways to prevent chronic diseases and conditions and to strengthen the immune system. You know, despite all that, disappointingly, we've seen in some contexts that uh, public green spaces, parks, or open spaces have been closed. And sometimes, you know, during this crisis, what we're seeing is this is exactly the moment that residents need them the most. So we're delighted to dive into all of these important issues and more today with our panelists. And we're gonna start with a moderated conversation. Um, and then around noon, we're gonna move to Q&A from the audience. So I think, as Ethan mentioned, you can submit your questions um, and vote up the ones you want answered in the Q&A box that you all should see at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to utilize that. You can also utilize the chat function if you'd like. Um, and so with that, let's get, let's get started. So I'd like to ask each of our panelists to take two minutes to tell us why they felt that it was important to take the time out of their busy days to join us um, on this panel today to discuss 
how we can all spend time safely outdoors during this pandemic. So I'm gonna start with Mark N from IS Global first. Hello, uh, I'm glad to be here. It's a real pleasure that uh, I'm based in Barcelona, unfortunately under a uh, complete lockdown. Um, we're not allowed to go out uh, except for shopping sometimes. And uh, so it's been a big struggle in a way. My interest is in um, urban and transport planning and uh, how it affects health. Uh, particularly trying to provide um, evidence for what are the health benefits or risk of our current urban and transport planning and try to promote uh, healthier planning um, and also transport planning. And, you know, public spaces are extremely important for us because, I mean, we need to be outside, we need to go out. Um, as you mentioned, the green spaces, but also what we see here, the squares in Barcelona, um, we need them for, for our health. Um, and unfortunately, in places like Barcelona, 60% of our public space is being used by cars. And we see that in many cities, that cities seem to be more for cars rather than for people. And what we need to do is change that around and make the cities more for people. And I'm hoping in a way um, that this unfortunate crisis may um, guide us into the right direction to away from our kind of unsustainable way uh, that we're living and how we're using our public spaces to a much more uh, sustainable, livable and healthy way of using public spaces. And um, here at IS Global, the um, um, Institute for Global Health in Barcelona, uh, we're at the moment uh, looking at, you know, how we could revision uh, our public spaces, how we could reuse them, how we could increase the use. At the moment, we can't use them, but I'm hoping that as soon as we get out of the lockdown, that we actually can start using them and actually can increase the public spaces for people and reduce it, say, for example, for cars. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Mitchell, let's turn to you. Hi, my name is Mitchell Silver. I'm the New York City Parks Commissioner. And just by way of context, uh, we have our parks open, some elements of closed. Um, we have about 30,000 acres or 12,000 hectares of parks in New York City. That's roughly 2,000 parks. And as Giselle said, uh, many cities are closing their parks. Uh, we believe it's important that we keep the parks open. We're a very dense city. And while everything else is closed, parks remains op remain open. And who knew uh, in this pandemic that every other space, bowling alleys, gyms are closed, that parks right now are our sanctuary of sanity. It's where people are going uh, for both physical health, but also mental health to build their immune system. And by and large, New Yorkers are social distancing, they're physical distancing. We have enforcement agents, we know the hotspots, we're sending out ambassadors to make sure people stay within six feet or two meters away. And that's something that we're committed to doing because the mayor recognizes that throughout our city of 8.6 million people, they need to get out uh, in their homes with their family. They could stay together, but most part, we want people to go solo exercise, uh, go out, exercise, and then go home. So it now has elevated the importance of parks globally. Uh, who knew that when everything else is closed, that parks and public space has now become that essential infrastructure to keep us sane. And so it's something that we're working very hard to make sure parks remain open. Uh, we're giving tips constantly about how you have to be outdoors, covering your face, keeping that physical distance, because we know the incredible value that people have. And I think New York City is doing far better and we are the epicenter. Right now in the United States, uh, well over 10,000 deaths and just hundreds of thousands of cases uh, that people do need that physical, that mental relief just to go outdoors. And so we're committed uh, to making sure they stay open, but we're also thinking about what's next here in New York City. And I hope they'll have those questions uh, during this conversation so we can talk more about where we're thinking. Final point, we are closing assets where we see people not social distancing, playgrounds, basketball courts, tennis courts. It is off for group play, but we wanna make sure of our 2000 park, something remains open so people in every neighborhood will have access to public space, be it an asphalt field or just a grass field so that they can come out and that parks are open for all. We wanna make sure parks are available to all. 
Well, thank you, Mitchell, for all that you're doing and for fighting to keep that asset open for all of us. I think it's so critically important and you're doing an amazing job and I know all New Yorkers appreciate it and it's a great model for the world. Um, with that, let's turn to Gil about his thoughts. Um, I'm Gil Penalosa, uh, founder and chair of 880 Cities. Um, I've worked in over 350 different cities around the world in all continents, and I can't even imagine how, especially in the low-income areas of the cities, they are dealing with this. That's why I'm so happy to join this conversation. We see that the World Health Organization, as well as almost every national health organization, and also local, are promoting walking and cycling and running, keeping physical distance uh, for 30 minutes, for an hour. But at the same time, the leaders of the cities, they are closing the parks, very well intentioned. Maybe they thought it was gonna be only for one or two weeks. They did not realize that it was gonna be for two, three, five months that we are gonna need to have physically isolated. Somehow, we, in many cities, we feel the liquor and alcohol stores are essential and are open but the parks are not and are being closed. Over 70% of the traffic of cars is down, but nevertheless, we keep all of the streets 100% for the cars. We know domestic violence is up, alcohol consumption is up, anxiety is up. There's a lot of issues and parks and streets and public spaces, they can be part of the solution. So we need to work on this. I think that the post COVID area has to be so much better, but we, Parks used to be thought of something that was nice, fun and games. But now we are realizing that it's fun and games, but much more than that. It's about mental health and physical health and mobility and the environment and economic development. So the change must start now. If we don't change when everything points out to the benefits of parks now, when are we going to do it? So that's why I'm so happy to join this conversation, focus on the crisis, but at the same time, we need to focus on the post crisis, the transition period, because it's not going to be a crisis and normal. No, there's going to be a crisis and a long transition, and then the new normal. So well said, Gil. No, it, all those things are so important, and I think people are really valuing their parks, um, and especially thinking about how our spaces can be utilized for people rather than only cars. I hope this is something we can continue um, after the transition, and, and hopefully, we'll get into that in the conversation. Um, so, Laura, are you, were you able to join us and uh, could you offer your thoughts? Perhaps Laura is still getting on. So I'm going to move to Mark. Um, Mark I o. think uh, Laura is on mute. There you go. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, hi, Laura. Yes, thank you. Yes, hi. Sorry, it has been a bit of a trouble to, to get on, but uh, yeah, thank you for, for making it happen. Uh, I'm very happy to be to be in this conversation. I wanted to, uh, I think uh, Ethan has already presented myself. I the, want to say a few words on new and habitat work on public space because we have been working to promote public space uh, uh, in urban development for the past uh, over the 10 years and more. And uh, um, particularly the Sustainable Development Goal 11.7, which uh, uh, is actually on access for all to public space, uh, is one of the of the major achievement uh, uh, of uh, our, our ourselves with a lot of partners. Many of them are also in this uh, conversation, uh, and also we we have managed to put uh, uh, public space quite at the center of the new urban agenda as well, and uh, all these. Uh, to support uh, really the effort uh, um, of uh, the international uh, community of activists, uh, etc., but also linking it up with policy, policy making uh, on on public space planning uh, and urban development uh, professionals. So we work uh, uh, with about uh, 50 countries and have developed quite uh, a number of tools that uh, uh, are targeting local governments and communities to. Uh, link local public space initiative uh, with uh, the monitoring of the SDGs in particular and also with uh, policy development. And I think uh, we are actually very concerned about uh, how this crisis uh, is affecting cities and how cities are responding to the pandemic. And of course, it's a moving target. Uh, things are changing and 
when you take a global perspective, of course, uh, so many countries are in different phases. So the learning is, uh, is, fully, on, is fully on. And I think uh, uh, something like this discussion is very, is very important to, to keep that learning uh, going. Um, we are also uh, concerned about Laura, you're out of time. If you could start summarizing, please. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, we, we would like to uh, highlight in particular that the impact of this uh, situation uh, is very severe on the 1 billion uh, poor people living in slums in an adequate uh, settlement. So public space for them is not just a recreation um, to, uh, item, let's say, asset, but it is also livelihood uh, and the food security related. And I think that that I mentioned we will would like really to be uh, kept in mind uh, to have a more global relevant uh, uh, recommendation out of all this uh, discussion. And uh, finally, I think this is, let's say, I don't like to call crisis opportunities. I think the crisis is very much still on uh, in reality, but we can actually learn quite a lot uh, and, uh, and use uh, some of the things that we are doing and we are learning and trying in cities at this point in uh, making space more available, more accessible, uh, uh, adjusting uh, the uses, adjusting the, the functions uh, in space, uh, supporting livelihood, etc. Uh, through public space also as a learning uh, process for cities, for local government, for decision makers. So I, I think that is, that is very much the, the direction we would like to take. I think there is also a risk that public space doesn't come out very well out of this crisis. So I think it's a responsibility collectively to to uh, also steer this process uh, and this learning in the in the right direction. Actually, I think. Absolutely. No, thank you so much, Laura. And we're just so glad that you and Habitat, who's been leading this work for so long, is a part of this important conversation. Um, so I'm going to turn to your colleague, um, Marco Jal, to also summarize his comments on the topic. So I will be. A uh, brief on uh, why I joined this, or why I think this is very important. One, COVID-19 has really exposed uh, vulnerabilities and the fragilities in cities, not just uh, around the healthcare system, but also on urban development and what is going wrong. Um, we've also seen, and I think uh, uh, Gail already talked about this, some of the unintended consequences of uh, the counter pandemic measures such as uh, violence, gender-based violence and uh, um, domestic violence. So really, um, we are keen on looking at what the city of tomorrow might look like. That's really the main interest, how to shape this conversation moving forward, but also reflecting on what we can do uh, at this stage, uh, potentially looking at uh, um, meanwhile approaches or tactical approaches to save the situation now, but then really look at how um, transformative urban development might look like looking forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. And I hope that we can get into that in the conversation as well, thinking about also, as you've seen other countries and cities go through this, how that can apply to some of the contexts that you all are working in and that are going to be hit uh, the most and how we can take lessons to make sure that we prevent that and also maybe develop in a more sustainable way moving forward. That's great. Um, Sarah, let's uh, move to you. Hey, thank you so much for including us in this panel. We're thrilled to be here. Um, so we were drawn to the panel because it's well in line with the work that Archive Global is doing. We're harnessing the power of the built environment to improve health outcomes in vulnerable communities around the world. We're designing, implementing, and evaluating purposeful human-centric projects that create healthy homes, increase health literacy, and safe behavioral practices among beneficiary communities. So Although we're most often looking at the household level, we consider public outdoor space to be at one of the many scales that's relevant to health. So others to include in that would be the peri-domestic environment or the environment directly surrounding the house, the community scale, the city scale, regional and national. As we're seeing with COVID, each of these scales is really relevant with the household being an important place for persons based health where chronic conditions are either ameliorated or exacerbated, where overcrowded, damp, unventilated, vermin-infested environments can make all the difference between spreading things like COVID or being a place where we can safely isolate and heal. The peri-domestic scale relates to our relationship with our neighbors, their proximity, 
um, to us, their impact on our household and shared experiences based on that proximity, including at times sharing a kitchen in some contexts, a common walkway, entrances or elevators, spaces where especially very contagious diseases can be transmitted. At the community level, we'll be able to start talking about the public spaces, infrastructure, reliable access to food, and so in many locations around, and in so many locations around the world, access to water and toilets, which often comes with waiting in a long line. At the city level, we'll be considering broader factors such as air pollution, public transportation, and building codes. And I'll stop there, but you can start to see the point, the different scales of the built environment or levels as public health professionals have asked me to call them are all inextricably linked to health outcomes. And so this is why I was drawn to the panel because the topic is critical and better understanding how the built environment has an impact on health is critical to combating COVID and so many other health concerns worldwide. The built environment is one of the factors that can be used as a preventative means for improving health rather than reactive. And with so many health systems struggling or failing, I think that's really important. Absolutely, and we're just so thrilled to have you as part of the conversation also because of the context and the populations that you're working with. Um, so last but not least, uh, Kelly, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Um, thank you, Giselle. Uh, thank you to everybody for having me. i um, very happy to be here today. Uh, of course, um, representing Project for Public Spaces, um, it's right there in our name. So we are um, really, I think, um, our hearts are kind of broken that this has been such um, a moment in time in our whole world where we've been unable to connect in these public spaces in the way that we are used to, in the way that we would like to. Um, and, you know, we're very cognizant of sort of what the future will hold or may hold and how important it is for us um, to really kind of do the right things right now and continue our connections right now. Um, I already can find myself personally sort of shrinking away from people when I am in places like grocery stores um, and out and about. And I, I kind of like can feel that in just five short weeks and it worries me. It worries me personally, it worries me professionally. Um, and so I'm really glad that we are um, having this conversation today. And I know there are many conversations going on about this. Um, professionally, I am here uh, because for the last several weeks, I've been working diligently with others, with other partners to help our public markets around, um, specifically around the US and Canada, but also globally, stay open or reopen and adapt to our current circumstances um, for a variety of issues, which I'm sure we'll get into, but access to food, of course, um, support for our local food systems and economies, and even just the idea that you know markets are a place where we can right now do something in a public space that supports small business. So looking forward to today's conversation and thank you again for having me. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you all so much. I think this is all, we have such an amazing panel representing so many different types of work across the world and it's critical to have everyone a part of it. So thank you all so much. Um, and with that, I'd like to jump into the specific questions that we have for the panel. So I'm gonna start um, with Mark from the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. And I wanna ask you if you could sort of zoom out and offer us a summary of what we know so far about COVID-19 from the scientific research and epidemiology perspective, um, and talk about some of the biggest public health threats that you're seeing so far as a result of, uh, you know, perhaps overly restrictive stay-at-home orders that do not allow for walks outside or visits to a park or green space. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Giselle. That um, I think we're all aware of the of the headline numbers at the moment uh, with the focus on the number of cases of uh, with. Uh, coronavirus, I mean, over 2 million uh, recognized cases in the world, uh, almost 200,000 deaths, and probably these numbers are an underestimation. Um, I think what we have less attention, what we get less attention to, what we pay less attention to is like other uh, unintended consequences, like what we've discussed before, I've heard a number of times saying that we have a reduced level of physical activity. Um, there have been some surveys around the world and what we're seeing, like for example in Barcelona, we've got quite a severe lockdown, we see a 40% reduction of physical activity. Uh, physical activity is extremely important for good mental and physical health, it's extremely important for the immune system, you know, uh, it would help fighting the virus in a way. It, it's, it's extremely important for cardiovascular health, metabolic health. 
uh, bone health, uh, cognitive functioning for kids, for example. And we don't quantify this uh, impacts at the moment. And, you know, you can do it for a few weeks, uh, a couple of weeks, but if it goes longer, like four or six weeks, you lose your fitness and, you know, you see the impacts already happening. That The other thing what's happening is what I said, the mental health. We see many uh, mental health problems, people reporting poor mental health. It's really gone up. Um, there's a lot of stress in being inside leading to uh, domestic violence. I mean, I've seen in some cases it's gone up by two, three fold uh, there. But then also other things like weight gain. Um, I think a lot of us are noticing being inside all the time and not moving that we've gained a few kilos. And that also helps health impacts what we tend to forget. I mean, and um, I must say I've noticed it myself as well that uh, then also as what a reported part of this is what we see because of the um, home containment. I mean, we see a reduced visits to green space. Here in Barcelona, we saw a 90% reduction of green space visits. Green space are extremely important for people's mental health, uh, for restoration purposes. And, and so this is gonna have a large um, impact, I think, on mental health, in particular in times when you need green space, when you're under stress, when you have poor mental health, you know, this is the time you actually need to have the visits. And here in Barcelona, we're not allowed to go to the parks, we're not allowed to go to the beach. Um, there are some good things, um, you know, there's reduced traffic, we have reduced air pollution, reduced noise, what is kind of a very beneficial to health. And, you know, I hope that we actually can keep this because we actually can hear the birds singing. Um, and that's an advantage that some of the measures to reduce the risk is, I believe personally, is not being indoors, but being outdoors with safe distancing. Uh, good Mark, dist you're out of time. Please start summarizing. Thanks. Yes, and uh, washing the hands. So these are some of the things what we're actually um, should be doing. And I think what we should be focusing on and, you know, letting people outside safely. Thank you. That's so helpful to hear from the epidemiology perspective, what the benefits are, what we're missing and what the risks are and how we might be able to get some of those benefits back in a safe way. Um, so Laura, I'm going to move to you and I'm going to ask you if you could start to describe some of the ways that COVID-19 is affecting cities in the global south and describe policy challenges that you're noticing regarding access to public spaces so far. Yes. Um, yes, thank you very much. I, I think uh, uh, we are in a bit of a paradox uh, when we talk of uh, developing countries because actually what we are seeing is that the demand for public space is at, at, at its highest in this situation. We have, a, uh, we have a situation in where we see public space becoming a critical lifeline for communities uh, uh, and residents particularly for the poor communities. So we, we have always been saying that uh, public space is a, a critical infrastructure, but when uh, you need to distance, when you need to uh, live uh, in, a, in a more confined uh, situation because you cannot travel outside the city, you cannot, uh, you have a lot of systems that are falling uh, a little bit uh, down. You also uh, can use, uh, and cities are using public space for the delivery of critical urban services much in a, in a more proactive way. Uh, there is also quite a lot of opportunities that are being seen in, in uh, how public space can help to reach communities and also uh, in um, the third place because houses are not sufficiently good uh, to really allow people to be confined there. So uh, they become a part of the solution actually. Uh, it's very different I think from developing countries where you have a, a, bigger, a bigger set of options maybe and public space are not so critical in the, and everybody is surviving without public space but in developing countries cities people cannot survive without public space it's, and it's all of a sudden it becomes very clear and very uh, uh, striking so what we 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 can see is that uh, we we have a, a lack of public space uh, in terms of quantity and uh, a lack of accessibility they are not well distributed across the cities so not all communities can can have the same uh, uh, access to these uh, as assets. And uh, we also see that the flexibility of public space and the use multi multifunctionality, multiple use, uh, becomes uh, so much more important and much more uh, creativity and uh, careful design is needed. Uh, am I? 
Am I no. connected? <laughs> You're still connected. I think that um, someone, and perhaps it's Cecilia, is um, is sort of moving the screen over to her. So, Laura, let's. I think those are great thoughts. Um, did you have one more point to add before we move to Mark? I think the other point, which I also mentioned at the beginning, is about uh, livelihood and food security. Uh, there is a, a huge potential to to be much more. Uh, considerate uh, about this when we look at public space uh, and so on. So we are actually proposing in terms of policy much more understanding and data on public space in the cities. There is very little knowledge even by local governments, uh, more governance on them uh, that involve the communities. And then of course we need much more understanding of compact and diverse neighborhoods because un unless we have that around public space then they are uh, not reachable, not very, very uh, effective. So these are the areas where we are w willing uh, to really work a bit more. And uh, I think uh, there is quite a lot that is being done in cities. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that but, is a future. Agenda. Yeah. No, I, I think it's so helpful to have that perspective and to hear the types of things you're doing and working with um, these communities on. And, and I hope that from this conversation, you'll also get some new ideas that you can actually implement in these communities that are most at risk. Um, and so, uh, Marika Ojal, I want to also ask you if th these are similar things that you're observing in Nairobi and what kinds of new challenges you're seeing that COVID is bringing to informal areas, for example, in Kibera or others that you're familiar with. Yes, I would uh, echo what um, Laura did mention and uh, in many ways reinforce what she was saying. I think um, some of the key challenges that we are using, uh, we are, that we are seeing are actually loss of livelihood. That has come out uh, as a key concern. Um, we cannot really uh, have a stable society with uh, such kind of uh, situations where people are facing starvation. So that's a key challenge. The other key challenge is also um, lack of wash facilities, uh, water and sanitation facilities. That's really a key challenge because um, as you may know, informal settlements are really overcrowded. And if these guys are really to follow the um, guidelines given by the government and WHO, one on physical distancing and on uh, um, and maintaining hygiene, it's practically impossible you know, in a place where um, there's no water. And if it is there, then it is really expensive. I mean, you know about poverty penalty, and this is really real in informal settlements. Um, the other thing that we are seeing uh, in Nairobi uh, increased cases of uh, um, uh, uh, gender-based violence and uh, uh, domestic violence, and more so in informal settlements. I think uh, the Chief Justice has come out and uh, openly talked about it because again the courts are closed you know you cannot really seek protection so again these are some of the things that are unintended consequences of COVID-19 that we are seeing and uh, again one other thing that we are seeing here is that uh, public spaces might be closed so while they are good but then we see uh, increased headlines you know that are condemning public spaces that young people actually um, using public spaces to congregate. Mm -hmm. So again, it's something that we need to look into moving forward. How do we ensure that uh, this continued um, opening of public spaces? So again, these are just threats that are uh, in Nairobi in so far as public spaces are concerned and uh, the effects of COVID-19 on, um, on uh, people in Nairobi. And this is not just Nairobi, but uh, it's a real issue in uh, fast growing cities. So it's really something to look into moving forward. Of course, those are so important and I hope that we can also start to get into the solutions in just a moment so that we can think about how um, those communities and those populations can best be informed of um, how to use those outdoor spaces safely, um, but also, you know, get advantages that they still can from those existing as well as bringing things like, uh, you know, basic utilities like water. Uh, to those communities. It's tough. And I think, Sarah, you're going to touch on this a little bit. Um, so I just want to ask you also if you could describe some of the particular concerns um, that you're seeing that the pandemic is bringing to vulnerable populations and the essential uh, workers in the communities that you work with. I know that you have um, several projects in Bangladesh and in Cameroon um, and others. So I was hoping you could sort of shed some light on that from your perspective. 
Sure, thank you for the important question. Um, I think it's important to start with the fact that many of the people who are now deemed essential workers were previously working unglamorous and undesirable jobs. And in many places around the world, we're doing this through informal means. So that means that they have no job security, no sick leave, no pensions, and very low wages. I mean, we're starting um, to hear quite a bit about this. But um, most of these people are living paycheck to paycheck and balancing costs associated to housing, health, and education against feeding their families. So savings are non-existent and many won't even have bank accounts. And now they've been kind of upgraded to the status of essential. Um, and so they're able to keep their jobs and they're able to keep coming to work and taking home a paycheck. And I think that's really important, but these are also the highest risk jobs. They're coming in contact with people every day. They're having to move through the city on crowded public transportation coming from conditions where their housing is inadequate. And as a reminder from my earlier point, inadequate housing means that these people will be more likely to have underlying health issues and to live in overcrowded environments. So you have some of the most vulnerable people exposing themselves at the highest rate to others who are coming from other similar communities and similar conditions. And then they're going back at the end of the day and bringing all of that stuff home. So the spread among of COVID amongst these communities is going to be like wildfire and you can see that just from the description and we're all relying on them and the families are relying on them but if they get sick they may not speak up because of those pressures because they have no job security because they have no savings so essential workers are a key piece of the bigger picture when we talk about vulnerable people in communities but it's particularly complicated because health starts in the home and as you remember i was mentioning that People are having to make really hard decisions and so improvements on housing is, is one of the last things. Um, so even before the crisis, people were not able to make improvements on their households when you're considering that they're, they're having to make these decisions over others. So the home is necessarily neglected and the vicious, vicious cycle continues. Sarah, could you start summarizing, please? Thank you. Um, the vicious cycle continues as people's health is undermined by their housing conditions. So an adequate housing is not just a problem of, you know, people out there and, you know, I appreciate the context that um, Laura and Mark are providing, but, you know, in New York City, I mean, Mitchell will kind of resonate this, um, in New York City, we have these problems, we have problems of really inadequate housing and of conditions that are making people sick, making those outdoor spaces so critical. Um, so just to sort of summarize quickly, all this to make the point that for some communities access to outdoor space um, although we're hearing that it's starting to be a resource just as outdoor space for kind of activity um, is going to be possibly beyond a primary concern. So we want to think about it as a resource rather, um, rather than just kind of a nice, um, excuse me, added bonus. No, that's great. Um, thank you, everyone. I want to also just ask Gil, Mitchell, and Kelly, um, you know, if there are other ways that access to parks and public spaces have been impacted so far by the pandemic that they want to bring to light right now while we're sort of setting the, the table for the challenges that we're seeing. Um, and in a moment, we'll get into the, the solutions for this. But um, Gil, Mitchell, and Kelly, any additional thoughts you want to add here? Well, in terms of uh, New York City, the mayor was very concerned. We have uh, 2,000 parks, 1,000 playgrounds, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that all families uh, throughout the city had access to the outdoors. Luckily, we had mapping tools. Uh, we knew exactly if we would close certain parks and playgrounds. We want to make sure everyone was within a 10-minute walk to a public space so we could pl close the playground but leave the asphalt field open for kids to run around or ride their bike same thing with ball fields. And so we were able to see within our entire city, about 55,000 New Yorkers were impacted out of 8.6 million. Because we closed a playground, they would have to walk a little bit further to a public space. So that for us is a bit of a concern. The weather's getting warmer, children are home, they wanna get outdoors. So for us, that was a pretty big impact as well as the mayor announcing that pools will be closed for the summer. And so we're thinking through right now, uh, because we hire seasonals now, lifeguards and other support staff, how is that gonna impact summer in the city? So this is really affecting our summers, not just now, but because of the hiring and the hiring freeze, it's gonna go away into the summer. So we're still making sure we can, uh, hopefully playgrounds can open up first, uh, and then that way we can use all of our water features within our playgrounds. 
But I think one of the biggest impacts we're seeing uh, is the fact that some people have to walk a little bit further to get to a local public space. It may not be a playground, but it could be just an asphalt field or some grass turf. And for us, that's fine. So equity and inclusion still remains very, very high on our list because we know the, the mental health and physical health benefits from public space. That's so important. Thank you for sharing that. And what an asset that you had the data and the mapping to be able to understand who was impacted and how and try to fill some of those gaps beforehand. Um, anyone else want to add anything uh, for the moment before we get into opportunities and strategies? Yeah, if I could. Um, you know, in the US, especially, I've been talking with a lot of the farmers market operators and managers. Um, and what we're dealing with right now is that, you know, for so long, we've sort of done almost too good a job um, bringing the social aspect of markets um, forward. And now so many of our cities are seeing markets as um, special events and have immediately shut them down. So interestingly, a lot of states have actually um, De deemed farmers markets to be essential services, much like our supermarkets, grocery stores, and what have you. Um, but the cities themselves are kind of coming in, they're sort of swooping in, even in these same states, and still shutting down these cities. And because a lot of these markets are running on special event permits, um, they, they have kind of no recourse. So unfortunately, this has an enormous impact on two, primarily two groups of people, the customers, and the farmers and the producers themselves. Um, the customers, you know, for the sake of this, this webinar today, I think are probably a lot of people's primary concern. And especially in um, locations where there are not really great access to healthy food, uh, these markets serve as a major access point. And without them, a lot of people are going to be kind of re relying on what little their corner store might have or take out, which is often not as healthy an option. Um, and we know that these markets are important. I was just on the phone last week with the manager of the Eastern Market in Detroit, Michigan. Um, they are coming up with a variety of ways to stay open and to still supply that city, which has been very heavily impacted by COVID-19, um, to be able to stay open, to be able to provide food access. They've actually seen um, in the same period of time between last year and this year, SNAP, which is the U.S. sort of federal nutrition assistance program. Melanie, please start wrapping so, up. Thank you. Yep. So, I mean, you can see that in this very moment, these markets are incredibly important and that people need access to this food. And so we're really, you know, begging basically for these cities to see that. Yeah, no, it, it's it's so important, and I'm so glad you're bringing light to such an such a critical issue for so many people. Um, we need to understand how to keep these markets open, both for the business owners themselves, but a lot in a lot of ways to make sure that people continue to have food access that's healthy and affordable. And in an open air setting, there are ways to make it safe. Certainly, um, great. Well, with with that, I this is a really wonderful um, conversation that we've started here. But I do want to um, take a more you know, optimistic and forward thinking approach to start thinking about solutions and opportunities that we have. So Gil, firstly, I'm going to turn to you and I want to ask you from your perspective as a global urban leader and advocate, um, you know, can you explain the value of parks and public spaces at an international scale and thinking about, you know, from your experience, do people of all ages and from various country contexts, do they, do they get the, an equal value from parks and open spaces and talk about a little bit whether you see opportunities from this crisis to transform cities into healthier, more equitable places in a way that could stay with us after, after we transition back to our uh, new old normal. Yeah, I, I think that we urgently need to change because we have not value parks and public places enough. Yeah. The reality is that we have a fantastic opportunity in many ways because in the next 40 years, we're gonna double the population that lives in cities. We're gonna go from three and a half billion to over seven billion people living in cities. So half of the homes that will exist in 40 years, which is nothing, is, the, is in the lifetime of our children, do not exist today. So how do we do it? The reality is that we, what we have done in the last 40 years, mostly is mediocre or horrible. 
there are very few exceptions. We've been doing cities that do not promote walking or physical activity or socializing. A lot of this COVID-19 is about health. Most of the, let me tell you, the wealthiest country in the world, the US, uh, one out of three children do not, oh, one out of three people, children and adults and do not have a part within walking distance in cities. One, and it was obvious that the crisis was gonna hit heavily in the US, the wealthiest country in the world. Why? Because over 40% are obese. Uh, over one out of, three, one out of five, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, one out of five have diabetes. There is over 50 million people do not have health insurance. The differences between the haves and the have-nots are gigantic. And this is happening in the wealthiest country. Imagine what is happening in the emerging countries. So we need to change our mindsets. We need to do things really radically different. And the, the parks and the streets, the role that they play. For example, everybody should have a park within walking distance. Everybody, a small park. But it's not only about small parks. We also need the large parks. And in the COVID-19, of course, we need to close everything that is about uh, doing in groups, the playgrounds, the sports fields, the courts. But we need to keep open the trails and the open space. The overwhelming majority of people are obeying the six feet or two meter distance. The few that are not, if we close the park, they are still not gonna obey it, but indoors, they're gonna meet in groups indoors and so on. You don't see them, but they're not obeying. So that's why I started by saying we need education, education, education. So that we need in parks. And on the streets, when we look at the city from the air, about a third of the cities are streets. It's our biggest public place. And somehow now we have 70% less traffic. For example, in the commercial areas, we need to double the size of the sidewalks. Let's get rid of car parking. So many cities are choosing car parks instead of people walking, doubling the size. Also, in all residential streets, we could make them slow streets, no through traffic. So only the people that live in the street can go. Oakland has done it for more than 25% of the streets. And then this is something that could be done everywhere, in the rich cities, in the poor cities, in the rich neighbors, in the poor neighbors, everywhere. And we also need to do a city -wide, please start wrapping up. Yeah, a city wide network. So of cycling. We, we, we can take away car lanes and create the network. And just to wrap up, I'm gonna say that if, if in this crisis, at the end of the crisis, we are able to have a share agreement that parks are not only fun and games, but that is about public and mental health and the environment. And if we have a shared agreement that the streets are public space and belong to everybody and can have different uses according to the time of the day and week of the year, then we will have moved forward. But we need to start today. If we don't start during the crisis, it's gonna be much more difficult to do anything after. Thank you, Gil. What an important call to action. I'm so glad that we're having this conversation today. And I hope that um, some of you who are attending this webinar today can take these messages back to our public policy makers and to think about doing what Oakland and other cities have started to do and to keep these changes permanent because we now recognize the critical value that they have on both physical and mental health. Um, so Kelly, you started touching on this a little bit, but I wanna go back to you and ask about the role of farmers markets um, and how they can, play a role in adopting safety protocols um, that do enforce physical distancing that is required, but also providing the affordable nutritious food in an outdoor environment during this, during this crisis. Sure, happy to speak to that. So I've been really amazed at how quickly markets have adapted to this moment of physical distancing um, with the help of organizations like Farmers Market Coalition and others to really pull together um, new layouts. So I've seen markets do everything from pulling tents wider and thanks to, um, in a lot of instances, folks like Commissioner Silver for allowing the markets to take up more space in these parks and parking lots and streets um, for that. So um, everything from laying out differently, um, creating sort of one-way lanes of traffic for customers, um, obviously, lots of markings on the on the street where they're buying lots of chalk and lots of spray paint right now. Um, you know, creating systems where there's a vendor who accepts cash or check cards, ideally cards, 
um, and a vendor who actually gets the product and the customers never touch the product until they've purchased it. Um, you know, to pick up services, um, drive through services, which unfortunately obviously are kind of supporting more vehicular act culture, but at the same time are kind of necessary right now to keep these markets open. Um, so they've been really amazing at adapting. Um, it's constantly happening. I'm actually working right now with uh, ARUP, the architecture firm, to come up with some guidelines for markets that we will be sharing hopefully very soon. Um, and one thing to really be uh, aware of, and I'm not sure about other public spaces are doing this as well, but doubling your staff. Um, many markets have had to actually add as many, you know, twice as many workers to really regulate the customers and not just set up, but actually like moving people through the market safely. Um, and of course, paying them hazard pay, which, you know, gets to a, another kind of behind the scenes point, which is that all of this costs a lot of money. Um, it's costing these markets a lot of money. Um, and they're going to need a lot of support um, financially when this is all over or, you know, to get us to the all over. Mm -hmm. No, those are, those are such important points. And I'm so glad that they've been so quick to adopt some of these. And I'll be very curious to see when you come out with some guidelines with Arab um, and hopefully, you know, they can be aligned also with CDC and WHO and what they're saying so that they can safely stay open. Um, but really important points also about providing pay to people to make sure that people can move th through those markets safely. Um, so Mitchell, I want to turn to you now, um, you know, as commissioner of one of the most important parks and recreation departments in the entire country, and arguably a model for the world, um, who's just getting over the peak of this pandemic, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about all the different health and safety strategies you've been promoting to New Yorkers so that they can all be sure to get outside safely to enjoy the benefits of your parks and recreation um, system that you, you know, worked so hard to keep open for everyone. Well, thank you, uh, Giselle. First, uh, because we had the parks open, we have a lot of enforcement out there. Most New Yorkers are complying to our social or physical distancing uh, regulations. So we have the police department, parks enforcement, and of parks employees, we have 200 park ambassadors. And they go out to the parks to make sure people are keeping that safe distance. In addition, we've now put up these big red signs, about six feet, two meters, in all of our parks so people can visualize what six feet looks like. And we're putting that in all of our major parks so people now can get an understanding about what it looks like. We've also launched Parks at Home. There was a question that I was about to respond to that yeah. now people can experience the parks at home. We have meditation sessions. We have Wednesday wanders. We work with rangers and we have some exercise classes. So we're trying to bring the park experience to people's homes uh, if they don't feel comfortable going out. And then because I'm a runner, I'm personally working with uh, various entities to explain to runners to cover your face, to keep that social distance, because that tends to be a problem here in New York City, a big running city. And we want to sh make sure people feel comfortable because some of the runners are getting a little bit too close, huffing and puffing. And so now there's a new order that we're encouraging people to cover their face if they can't maintain a social distance. And so we're pushing a lot of material uh, each and every day on all of our social media platforms. But we also want to be positive that parks are open. However, if you do not comply, we'll have to close elements of that park. So for us, that's a very important message because, again, we know the benefits of parks. And so we've been very, very proactive. The only open entity public space in all of the city is now available. And so we want to make sure either outdoors be safe or you can use our parks at home platform. Gosh, Commissioner, I mean, you are just setting a model for the world, and I hope that other cities will take note. Um, you know, everything that you're doing and everything that you've been pushing even before these guidelines came out are in line with the new CDC guidelines around what park administrators should be doing to keep people safe and what visitors should be doing when they do visit public and open spaces. And so um, you've touched on all of them, and I will make sure that we get a list of those two and can refer the audience to where you can find those on CDC, but you're just doing such an excellent job. And so I, I think all New Yorkers and, and all cities uh, appreciate the model that you're setting. I think especially around starting to socialize or communicate well and just doing everything we should be doing in crisis communications to be effective and consistent and stick to the facts, but also socialize the idea of masks where it's not something that we're so used to in the US. So um, I, I think that's so important. 
And I, I just want, we're about at time and we're gonna move to Q&A in just a moment, but I did wanna ask the other panelists if they had additional um, points they wanted to make about how people, um, what he, they want people to know about safely spending time outdoors um, and managing parks and public spaces during this crisis. Well, I wanted to make a small comment on the need to have some of these things citywide. Because for example, if we create slow streets and we only do a very few of them, then everybody's gonna go to them and there's gonna be gatherings. But if you do it like Oakland, that is almost citywide, 25% of the streets, then there's not gonna be an issue. Same thing with the parks. If you close the sports area and the playgrounds, but you allow people to walk or run in the rest and you do it in all the parks, there's not gonna be gatherings as much as if you, if you have it. So, so it, it is critically important to do some of those activities. And the other thing I wanted to make emphasis is on equity. equity. Yeah. This is a huge problem because traditionally, the way we've been doing cities, we have like a two tier park systems. In the wealthy areas of the cities, magnificent parks and public places. In the poor areas, almost nothing. And now we need to rethink and when we realize in the in the short term, we need to habilitate any area for people to be able to go out, parking lots, streets, the parks. But in the post-COVID, we need to realize that the parks, we need to raise the level of awareness. There's gonna be tons of money all over the place in the transition and then in the post-COVID. And if mm -hmm. we use all that tons of money to do roads for cars and not parks for people, we will have missed. We really need to come out much better than what we were before. Of course. And I just want to ask um, Josh or Francisca, our tech team, I don't know if it's the same, but I think that the screens are stuck on, I think they're stuck on Kelly right now. Are you seeing that they're switching to um, the commissioner and to Gil when they're speaking? And is there a way to, for us to fix that? Oops. Now we see Gazelle. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. perfect. I just okay, I think it's right out. I don't know if this, the screen can come to me. I'm sorry. But you can see the screen that you can see all the speakers. Yeah, I just to... wanted to show people who okay. knew these things we had in parks uh, would now, their people are demanding them. We're out of stock. We gave them to our staff commuting. But this is a running buff. It's very easy to cover your face. It's parks brand. And so you could be cool and send a message mm -hmm. on social distance. So, uh, we're going to put more out there for prints. You can look at our website, see if we can purchase them. But it's cool, safe, and it's great to go out with this. Oh, Commissioner, I want one of those. And I want one for Barcelona and Nairobi and everywhere else. I think that's a great idea. Well, like I said, uh, we're out of stock right now because we gave it to all our staff who are commuting to work. And so we're going to try to get another one because this is part of, a, of COVID. And so, like I said, you can get them done, manufactured for your local city, and you can wear them proudly. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, so let me ask the others, if there's one thing that they want attendees to take away that they didn't get a chance to mention today um, that they'd like to, and we'll just keep those really short and then we'll move to the q and Is there anyone else who wants to give um, their one takeaway? Yeah. Yes. Can I go, Matt? <laughs> okay, let me proceed. Um, there are two things which I think need to be taken Perfect. forward. The first is the importance of uh, um, community self-organizing. This has not been emphasized enough and uh, the communities really know where the needs are, the gaps are, and they have a lot of innovation. And this can offer a lot of learnings for practitioners in particular. I think uh, we need to encourage city leaders to work with communities. Mm -hmm. The other thing which I wanted to mention, which is also important, is the need for more research and collaborations between communities of practice from uh, um, public health community of practice to the built environment community of practice. We also need to train the next generation of urban development practitioners. These conversations about public space need to move to the universities. We need to have networks of uh, um, learners. We need to have uh, networks of uh, people who set the next research agenda. And this, in many ways, will, will help us to shape the city of tomorrow. Thank you. That's great. Um, I saw a couple others jump in. I think um, Mark from Barcelona Institute of Global Health, did you also want to say something? 
Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, one of the things is to think about uh, what's come back to the point before that streets are also public spaces and, you know, you can claim them back from the cars and use create some new space. Like here in Barcelona, we've got the super blocks. Um, what is creating more public space for people. And if you don't know about the super blocks, I posted a paper on the, on the chat where there's some more information on there. But, you know, there's also what we're doing is bringing in more green space into the city, in the super blocks, temporarily at the moment to see how people get used to it. Uh, but in the long term, also keep it there, you know, permanently in a way. And so I think this, I've seen this now in other cities being done as well, where they bring in temporarily the green space into the streets and create nice environments that people can keep sufficient distance from each other, but also have green space. Um, Today, there was in the Guardian newspaper, there was about Milan that's going to close lots of the streets for cyclists, for pedestrians, etc. So there are cities that are taking the lead. Absolutely. Um, I saw Bogota also has opened some of their, you know, they always have the Ciclovia, but they've done some dedicated bike lanes and maybe some of those could become permanent. Um, anyone else for a last word before we move to Q&A? Can I, can I say just something? Yes. Oh, sure. I, I just I, yes, I, I think uh, I, I, I subscribe it to, to most of, I mean, almost uh, fully to everything that has been said. I think we need to pick the opportunity of the cultural shift that is happening. I think uh, uh, I see it very clearly in the developing country cities where public space is, is uh, getting a completely different uh, um, press, let's say. And uh, I, I just have an anecdote uh, about Uganda. We were discussing with Mark. Uh, until a couple of years ago, it was considered scandalous in, uh, in uh, Uganda uh, for people uh, of a certain standing, let's say, or class, to walk in the street. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a politician that was opposing the president that he was actually doing it by walking in the street. And he was being arrested for walking in the street. And now we see the president walking, the president going on the bicycle and uh, showing uh, a different way of uh, interacting with public space. And uh, I think this is, this is, this cannot be overestimated. I think it is something we need to build on and, uh, and um, make use of it uh, uh, as it happens and use it as an opportunity. And I really hope that all this uh, uh, discussion we are having is going to have really an impact on how Legislation is being going to be uh, is going to be done in these countries uh, on uh, on public space, on sharing public space, on who can be in public space. We have huge problems still with the informal sector in the public space in many cities, despite the public the informal sector being so important and crucial uh, for the city to to function, to economy to function. We have a, a lot of uh, uh, segregation of public space for different uh, groups, uh, etc. I think these are the issues that maybe we have an opportunity to, to break, uh, break down quite significantly. Um, and I think uh, we, we need to, to document these things. And I, I fully agree that we keep uh, that uh, documentation exchange uh, going. Absolutely. I think... Giselle? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to clarify. Yeah. When I say there's going to be tons of money, it's not because there's not going to be an economic crisis. The crisis is going to be huge. Yeah. But nevertheless, the only way to restart the economies is all the countries are going to have to go in debt and invest in money. And traditionally, any time that there is an economic crisis, they cut the budget of parks. Right. And they cut the budget of public places. Why? Because they think most decision makers think that parks is just fun and games. So if we cut that budget, there is nothing that is going to happen. Instead, for example, they always increase budget of police and others, and they increase the budget of roads. The reality is that that's why it's so critical that we make a very strong effort to change the mindsets. And parts, the fun and games is very important, but in addition, this is gonna be about mental health and physical health, and this is gonna be about the environment. So if we don't raise, and also because any investment in park is heavy in labor, so you're going to be yeah. able to hire tons and tons of people. So we need to actually be working right now on lots of projects and lots of design so that as soon as the economy starts to open and as soon as the government starts to uh, go in debt to invest in projects to restart the economy, parts is going to be on top of mind and is not going to be a leftover. Gil, you know, it's such an important point, and I think we're all saying similar things, right? But that 
I think the point of the cultural shift is also a great one. So, you know, what I hope is that we can take advantage of this moment uh, to shift the culture and to recognize the value of public spaces, both our existing green spaces and parks and invest in those, uh, but also to open new ones, as so many of us have said, and hopefully maintain some of those improvements, that, for example, in air quality, which by the way, um, you know, makes it easier for people to, I think, um, fight this, this particular pandemic, but also has so many other benefits. Benefits. So if we could actually take this opportunity to value those things and start to invest in them as public health infrastructure to really recognize the connection and the impacts they have, I think that could be something great that comes out of this. So um, all these points are so important and I'm so, I'm so pleased to have this conversation with this amazing panel today. So um, with that, I want to move to, um, we have a couple of moments. For Sorry, yes, Sarah, please go ahead. Um, I just wanted to also say that, especially for vulnerable populations, I yeah. think, you know, Laura and Mark are really um, touching on this, but also touched on this, you know, there may be also opportunities to provide information and education for vulnerable populations within these parks or kind of surrounding the public space. We don't know what kind of access people have, whether it's, you know, radio or television or access to the internet. So there may be a place, especially with COVID, that's kind of evolving so rapidly, information is kind of out of date as soon as it's put out. Um, so really, we may want to also think about the kind of function of the public space, in particular communities, there may be additional things we can provide like education. I mean, I think the job opportunities through the markets is really critical, but let's also think about how we get information, critical information <clears throat> to people, proper hand washing, all of those kind of things, the messages need to get out to the most vulnerable. Yeah, no, that is a great point. And I think as we know um, from anyone who's worked in behavior change, behavior change is so difficult to do, but this might be a great opportunity. And what I have been sort of heartened to see is that in some informal communities, for example, in some of the ones in Brazil that I used to work in, um, in Hosinia and others, they've been doing a really interesting communications campaign by the community for the community. So they're incorporating cultural signifiers that matter to them and they're using local um, community members to spread that message. For example, in some of the funky music that they have there or bl you know, blasting it from sound by the cars, which we see in a lot of areas as well. So a way that makes sense culturally to make sure that people will get the message and to really sort of trust the message that they're getting. Um, so I think that's, that's also something that we should really be thinking about because over and over in this crisis, what I've seen is the crisis communications and the method of communications is what sort of matters as to what people listen to. Um, so thank you for everyone for those really important comments. Um, Francisca, I want to ask you if you've gotten some questions that, um, through, the, through the mechanism we have there maybe that have been voted to the top that you want to bring up with our panel. Um, we have about, I would say, seven to seven to five, 10 minutes or so to go through mm -hmm. some of those questions before I want to make just one or two closing points. Okay, great. Uh, so we've seen some trends in the questions. I think we've seen a lot of questions around slow streets and cars that we already talked about. Uh, there are some questions around management and also some around building trust back to public spaces. So I want to focus on the last two maybe that we haven't talked. Uh, starting with our build environment department sufficiently engaged in the pandemic relief uh, crisis management group and is discussions on post crisis planning mainly run by the health sector. And if not, how can that be improved? Um, could, you, could you just restate the beginning? I wanna make sure that, um, that all the panelists could understand mm -hmm. the beginning of the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is our built environment department sufficiently engaged in the pandemic relief uh, related to crisis management groups? And if not, how can that be improved? Okay, so the question is, are they connected with the public health experts to take a part in, you know, how they are um, dealing with the crisis and also the recovery? Is that it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, would any of the panelists like to comment on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, we absolutely have to. Uh, there's no way that, you know, you, you, you rise together, you fall together. And if you have the silo thinking, silo thinking, you're not going to get the right result. It has to be. Uh, those involved in the built environment, parks, planning, public health professionals. Public health professionals and planners have historically worked together. And because the profession started out of a public health crisis, and so this has been happening again and again from the 1800s, the 1900s, 20th century, 
21st century. So this is really a wake up call that we must as public health professionals, as open space advocates, planners, urban designers, must work together. We're doing that right now in New York. What does the restart and recovery look like? Right now we're working on our plans individually, but our goal through the mayor's office is to bring us all together because now this is now a new normal, a new reality that we have to deal with and we cannot do this in silos. That's great. And I think it's so important. Does anyone else want to comment on that particular question? I think Cecilia is there, raising her hand. Ah, okay. Can we move to Cecilia? Did you want to respond? Cecilia is one of the, um, you know, the illustrious UN Habitat colleagues. Thank you. I won't take much time, but I think I would like to just move to Oh, Cecilia, uh, we're having a little bit oh, of sorry. trouble hearing you. Um, just want to make sure you get close enough to the mic so we can hear you clearly. Better, I think. Yeah, just very, very quickly, just to add to what already Mitchell. I think we should really, as, as Mark said as well, well, first, I would love Mitchell to make a, a paper of what he because I think you have a lot of lessons there, definitely. Second, I think we should really find out about, in a very way, consequences and what are the mistakes that we have done, because there have been a lot of mistakes around here. And we have noticed as well that most of the hands of the people dealing with cities are not in countries. I think that was a big mistake. And what the challenges for me are, some were not. I think we need to create more resilient cities. And for that, we need to find out through design, through ruling, how can public spaces in general can work with other disciplines? We haven't done that. In terms of economic, the market, because that's gonna be a big problem. In terms of environment, in terms of health, in terms of education, and in terms of security. I'll give you an example. Lots of children around the world are going to go back to school through web and using Zoom. Half of the population in the world don't have wi you know, even the Wi-Fi. So just as uh, he mentioned, using some of the spaces, some, some of the streets to bring children to get together around a, a set of, of, you know, a wide something that could be helped. I think we need to start thinking in very different way and uses for public spaces, and that's a big challenge. I think, as you mentioned, that we're going to go back to the old normal. There's not going to be old normal, just as they mentioned. I think we're going to have different crises of the height. Yeah. 85, I was old enough to go through an earthquake, terrible earthquake in Mexico City. And what really brought the population back again was the organizations, were neighborhoods, were all these kinds of things. So I think we have done a wonderful job, just like Laura mentioned, about putting space in the spot through cities. Now it's the time to say how much can we still work on the, in the future now and for the future? How can we deal with all these other new disciplines that we haven't been working on? Thank you, Thank Cecilia. You. I, I don't know if anyone else had trouble hearing, but I tried to um, take note of everything since it was a little bit broken up. So the first point you had was that um, Commissioner Silver should write a paper on everything he's been doing. The second point was that we should really take notice of the mistakes so we can not make them again in the future. And the third was to really emphasize how public space professionals and built environment professionals need to be working across sectors, economic, education, public health, et cetera. Great points. Um, uh, Francisca, I wanna ask if there's another question that was brought up for the panel. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and maybe to start finalizing our questions, uh, Savine was asking about, uh, we all, she says, we all know how important social life is in public spaces. How could we reactivate social interaction in public spaces within the restrictions like, like social distancing, as well as people being anxious with them? So how, how can we bring back social interactions to public spaces in times like this? I think it's a great point. And I just want to clarify that I've been in favor of um, moving from calling it social distancing to physical distancing, because I think social, as we've heard probably at this point um, quite extensively, the social distancing implies that you have to be socially unsupportive or distant from your um, friends, family, colleagues, which is not the case. I think we can be socially close and supportive while still saying that physical distance apart. And so that might be um, sort of the way I reframe the question for the, for the panelists, because it's the physical distance more so that matters. Would anyone care to um, jump into that? 
Well, uh, I think that's a great point to change and, and make it physical distancing because we need to be socially closer than ever, whether it is through making, calling our, our friends, our parents, is we, we need that sociability. And also, I think we need to raise the level of importance of the parks and public place, especially low income people all over the world. When you live in a 35 square foot, uh, a square meter home, uh, you don't live there. You sleep there, you live outside. So low income people need even better sidewalks and better bikeways and better parks. And unfortunately, we do it the other way around. In the wealthy neighbors, we got great parks. In the low income neighbors, we have terrible. So, so we need to change that mindset and we need to highlight that when we talk about parks and streets and sidewalks and public places, it's not just something that is cute and is for the upper class is actually even more important. We're talking about critical issues. And I do think that is critical. Traditionally, parks have not worked very well with other departments. This is a, a time of crisis that should, con uh, post the crisis, we must continue working together, eliminate the barriers and realize that sidewalks, sidewalks are actually more part of the family of the parks than of public works and streets. We need almost the same things. So we need to, Public health has to be almost like, public health is almost like the umbrella. If everything we did in our cities had to have public health uh, and the benefit, and the well-being of all citizens as a guideline, I think we would have better cities for everyone. That's a great yeah. point. So advocating for health in all policies um, and also thinking about, you know, how we can open, how really bringing uh, the, the physical distance element to public spaces, we might need to open more spaces like we've been discussing throughout the call. Um, and yeah. Commissioner, I think you had some points you wanted to make. Number one, I want to make sure we don't overreact because uh, sometimes when something happens, you tend to go the opposite direction. So I think we have to be very thoughtful. I don't know how the public's going to react in large gatherings or public spaces. Mm -hmm. They're going to figure it out themselves. And I think we have to watch and observe and work with the public. I'm particularly concerned about children. I've been talking to a lot of parents about how the children are being affected by this pandemic being put on a pause or a lockdown and going out to public space. Uh, one parent said when they're outside and they see people with masks, they assume everyone is sick. So for our children, how will this affect them going forward in public space when so much is closed? So I, I, don't, I wanna first observe and listen, have conversations before I jump to solutions because people may start to regulate. We certainly know personal hygiene is going to change. But about the physical distancing, we have to watch and see where people feel comfortable, and then we have to work with them together to figure out some of the solutions rather than jump ahead and assume this is how we now have to plan our public spaces. I agree, wider sidewalks, development regulations have to change. In many places, you can only slow a physical distance if you walk into the street because the sidewalks are so narrow and the footpaths are so narrow. Right. But I just wanna make sure we have this conversation with the public so that we don't overreact uh, and that we actually do it seeing how the public is going to slowly ease back into the new normal or reality. No, those, those are really wonderful points. Um, I, and I think the one actually about children is especially important and I don't know the answers yet. Um, I'm sure some people on the panel will have some ideas, but I think it's something that we really need to think about, especially because children are really, they're being restrained physically um, even more so than usual and they really need social uh, interaction to grow and to learn. So. Um, I think that's going to be a question moving forward. Um, we're about at time, so I want to be respectful. Um, sorry, did someone want to jump in? Uh, yeah, for the children, I think it's yeah. important what's right. being recognized, actually, that the risk of transmission is lower at the moment with children. And for example, in countries like the Netherlands, they're thinking of bringing kids back to school because the risk of transmission seems to be much lower for them and uh, also they're not severely affected. Um, I think that's slowly being recognized. I think one of the big problems at the moment, what we're having, and I think you were referring to it, is that people have fear to go out in the street. I mean, so many people say we don't want to go out because, you know, because of the virus, but probably it's one of your safest environments being outdoors. Uh, and we need to get that message across. As long as you, if you're in your outdoors, you know, and you keep safe distance, it's, it's much safer than being inside with others. Yeah, especially when you have ventilation issues or you have overcrowding issues. I think that's an excellent point that people need, you know, we need to communicate that better. Um, and it is a great point also about children. 
I guess my question keep, continues to be, but children can be sort of these vectors that can pass it on to people who are vulnerable. So we still would want to separate, um, you know, kids, even if they're less at risk from getting it severely to passing it on to our, you know, our but elderly or all vulnerable. This evidence shows. We're starting to see also studies, Giselle, where children get much less affected physically, but get, might get even more affected mentally because children are used to going outdoors and even yeah. in the playgrounds and in the daycares, they are outside all the time. And all of a the sudden, they see their parents are anxious. They hear in the news from the back anxiety. So they, the children need as much the parks or even more the parks, even not the playgrounds, not the, where there are groups, but even just to go out and walk and be on the outdoor and next to nature, maybe even more than the adults. The mental health of children is, is really critical and is just as affected or more than the adults. I think those are excellent, excellent points. Um, so I just wanna have, make two quick takeaways to close with, and I think we've covered all of this actually, but just sort of in summary, um, you know, as we've mentioned, we know that this disease has been evolving so quickly and there's still so much we don't know. Um, and many of us has been asking the last couple of weeks, you know, what is it safe for us to do as public space managers, as, you know, cities and policymakers, or even as citizens in, open spaces during the crisis. And so, you know, for my part, I've been working with my CDC colleagues for several weeks on this. Um, the ones that I normally work with on NCD prevention in the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity um, to answer some of those questions. And, and, you know, we've gone through so many of them today. And I think the panelists here are just excellent examples on all of these points. But I thought that some of you might be relieved who are listening today, as I was, to know that there's now specific guidelines, at least from the CDC, available for park administrators and also for visitors. But I just wanted to quickly summarize for you today. Again, most of the panelists have mentioned all these things. You can also find it on the website if it's helpful. Um, and I'd like to just make you know one more sort of ask of all of you who work with policymakers to help educate your colleagues about both the benefits um, and the risks of spending time outdoors, remembering that the vast majority of public health experts and, and the research that we're seeing, it seems to be a general consensus that the benefits generally greatly outrisk the risks of being outdoors if you can safely follow the following guidelines. So, just as a reminder, you know, when you're visiting public spaces, you really should not be visiting. Um, if you were sick or you were recently exposed to the disease, you should never visit a crowded park or a crowded entrance. Um, if a parking lot is crowded, you know, you shouldn't go in that day. Uh, you shouldn't be visiting playgrounds if there are any that are still open. You really shouldn't be participating in organized activities or sports, including water sports. Um, and when you do visit, it's best to plan ahead to try to check and see how many people are using that space and to really stay as close to home as possible to not expose transit workers, for example, um, that don't need to be. And then of course, to always follow all of the guidelines that we now know around maintaining physical distances of at least six feet or two meters from each other from wearing masks at all times, including running. And thanks to the commissioner for showing us some really, some really hip options for runners. Um, and then to follow all the steps, including you know, regular hand washing, um, of at least 20 seconds, et cetera. And if you're an administrator or a manager, um, I think what we've seen here today are examples of practicing excellent crisis communications, which means communicating often, consistently, and focusing on the public health facts. Um, and also to consider creating opportunities, websites, apps, or even using Google um, when it is accurate to track the open space usage of a place or of a park so you can check in advance. Um, and of course, always um, continuing to try to find opportunities to open new spaces for outdoor use to alleviate any crowding that you're seeing. Um, and as some of the panelists have said, that they're out there educating and forcing monitoring physical distancing in popular areas of parks um, that, for example, in New York could get crowded, making sure you're there um, to maintain those, those important guidelines. And of course, postponing and canceling organized activities and sports, large events and gatherings, and importantly, maintaining restrooms, ensuring that if your parks or open spaces are open, that the restrooms are also functional, that they have toilets, that they're clean, that they're disinfected surfaces, that there's adequate hand washing supplies. Um, and then for staffing, of course, always keeping your staff up to date with the latest public health guidelines and preventative actions and using flexible sick leave and telework policies. So, 
Um, with that, I just want to thank every one of you who've joined today. I saw hundreds and hundreds of people tune in. So it's great that you also feel that this is important. We want to remind you that the recording is going to be posted on the website afterwards, as well as any accompanying follow up uh, materials that the panelists would like to um, would like to send in. So with that, I want to thank everyone for their time. And um, we'll see you next time on the Placemaking X webinar. Thank you, Giselle. I'll just, just close with a couple last thoughts. This has been really inspiring and uh, I really want to thank all the panelists for offering such a you know, rich, passionate um, set of perspectives and expertise. Um, we want to continue to build on this conversation on social media and other ways. We're open to any ideas that have any one of you have to, um, to continue the conversation, crowdsource solutions and ideas. The idea here is to network the learning, the action, the advocacy, uh, the collective advocacy to show that we're not in this alone. Uh, we're all dealing with similar issues around the world. Each city is trying to, is coming at it from a different set of challenges, but I think all the more important reasons to, uh, to, to learn collectively. Um, we are, this week actually, we're publishing an article from Wuhan. We actually held a big placemaking conference with you and Habitat um, in Isocarp in, uh, in Wuhan a couple years ago. And uh, they're now starting to recover and learn from how public spaces can help facilitate that recovery. Obviously, New York is still in the thick of it, but how we all learn in New York from this, we want to share with parts of the world that are perhaps more even more vulnerable and, and, uh, and developing on, and, on how they can cope with the crisis as it comes. And then, of course, as we all um, come out of this crisis uh, and start to plan for coming out of this crisis, whether it's in the months or years ahead, um, we need to coordinate our, our advocacy, our action, our learning networks to look at places after COVID. And that's actually will be the subject of, a, of an upcoming webinar that we're gonna do in partnership with um, Placemaking Europe. Uh, they're, they're now crowdsourcing places after COVID uh, through that hashtag. Um, uh, so we invite you to add to that if you have ideas for how we should be planning and, and building our public spaces proactively. Um, Placemaking Latino America is also holding a conference this Friday and Saturday, obviously all in Spanish. Gil, Gil Penulosa and others will be involved in that. We'll be covering many of these issues as well. Um, so, the, so I, look for, I would encourage everyone to connect with the regional placemaking networks. You can, through Placemaking X website, you can, uh, you can add to, I'm just gonna, um, sorry, just muting. Uh, um, so just want, everyone go to the Placemaking X website. You can sign up if you're not already getting the newsletter. Uh, but also connect with the regional networks. Uh, there's 14 of them that we want to, to build their capacity to, to address these issues and, and, uh, and collaborate together uh, and, and have feedback obviously through, uh, through Placemaking X as well. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, please be in touch with ideas on how we can build in this conversation and all work more effectively together. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, I'm feeling more optimistic already. I appreciate it. <laughs> Cheers everyone, thank you. Take care. Bye, all the best. Stay safe, stay healthy. You too, all the best. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.